Hey everybody, welcome to another episode here on Bully Whispers, and we are here today to evaluate the answer to the question, how Machiavellian is Marlo Stanfield? Between his cold ruthlessness and his aggressive expansion of his territory, he's a habitual line stepper. He would seem to fit the part, but is that necessarily so? For viewers new to this series, Machiavellianism is far more specific than just who's the best schemer or some general notion that the ends justify the means. The Prince is essentially a how-to-rule manual for current or aspiring leaders, detailing the most effective ways to deal with specific people and different circumstances based on Machiavelli's historical observations. So, how Machiavellian was Marlo Stanfield? In evaluating this question, we will divide his time up into four parts. The war with Avon, when he ran West Baltimore before joining the co-op, his time with Prop Joe in the co-op, and his taking out of Prop Joe until the end of the series. When we do so, we will notice that while many of his individual actions were quite Machiavellian, his overall character actually was not, and one concept in The Prince fairly accurately describes his success. So, let's kick this off with his two major overall shortcomings. First, Machiavelli describes three levels of intellect, the third, or lowest of which, is incapable of understanding, the second, or middle group, which is capable of understanding what they are shown, and the highest level, which is capable of innovation. While Marlowe is certainly no dummy, he can't be put in the top group because he never really shows any innovation. All of his operational leaps forward came under the tutelage of Prop Joe or the Greeks, but that does show that he can learn. The question then becomes, where in the second group does he fall? And to be honest, I don't think it's in the top part. For starters, with the more advanced things like money laundering, he still seems a bit lost, but more significantly, it's due to his lack of awareness, which he shows us in his very first scene. I'm doing it don't, but I got some place to be. Now, while this scene is quite effective in showing us how cold and ruthless he is, it also shows an incredible lack of concern for law enforcement, which is something he continues throughout the show. In this capacity, Marlowe shows the flaw in the whole chess analogy surrounding the game. In chess, unless you're a grandmaster playing multiple games, it's one on one, but in real life, it's not. In real life, there are many players on the same board, all with different pieces and abilities and Marlowe is consistently unaware of one of the bigger players on the board, the police. From there, after making some waves, he was approached by Stringer Bell about joining the co-op, where we see several Machiavellian principles come into play. First, according to the prince, when dealing with a civil principality, which the co-op was designed to appear to be, two distinct parties emerge, nobles who want to rule and people who don't want to be ruled, with Marlowe, of course, being in the latter group. Second, if a person resists because they are brave, you should let them live, because if you win them over, you have gained a courageous ally. However, if he resists because he's ambitious, then his motives can never be trusted and he should be killed. Now at this point, they didn't know if it was due to bravery or ambition, but the answer to that came very soon afterwards. Tell our people the two love. And this brings us to the third Machiavellian aspect brought up with this meeting, where we compare their soldiers. At this point, Avon is largely working with mercenaries like Slim Charles, and according to Machiavelli, reliance on mercenaries is bad because they will leave when things get rough. And you with Prop Joe now? Never would have thought. Yeah, well, life's strange. Marlowe, on the other hand, has the best crew in Baltimore, and he manages them in a way recommended by the prince. Even during times of peace, a leader must keep his troops well-trained and ready to fight, which Marlowe seems to be the only leader doing. On top of that, his troops are incredibly loyal to him, both of which he would have needed had he stayed in power longer, because according to Machiavelli, the foundation of all states lie in good laws and good arms, and we all know his laws would suck. Either way, from there the war between Marlowe and Avon was on, and it's here that we run into the second overall characteristic that hinders him from being truly Machiavellian. According to the prince, a leader must be like a lion and a fox, with the lion being strong enough to scare away the wolves, and the fox being able to avoid traps, and Marlowe isn't fox-like. He is, however, often perceived by fans as being one, and a large part of that perception begins with his feigned retreat strategy against Avon. Please leave them corners, he's gonna be back out there. I know he will. However, this isn't avoiding a trap, it's setting one, which is hunter behavior, and he's now shown himself to be a clever lion, but he still can't avoid traps as Slim Charles has him in his sights. Fortunately for Marlowe, Slim was unable to get a hold of Avon due to a chess game between Avon, Stringer, and the police, which is where we run into the concept in The Prince that accurately describes his success. Luck. According to Machiavelli, good fortune is the reason for half, maybe more of our actions, but the rest is free will. If you are relying on good fortune and those fortunes change, you are in trouble. 
Now, while Marlowe's luck seems to hold out through the series, there is a good argument that it didn't, but we will get to that towards the end. Moving into the period where he ran West Baltimore before joining the co-op, his individual actions continue to be very Machiavellian. According to the prince, a leader in this situation should start out violent because it's easier to start out that way than to be lenient at first and then grow violent, although he still shows a lack of awareness about the police, especially long term, by putting the bodies in the vacants. He gives money to the locals, making sure they know it's from him, which improves his reputation, and while doing so, notices Michael Lee. The story of Michael joining and leaving the Stanfield organization is actually quite Machiavellian. According to the prince, men will change leadership willingly to better themselves, which Michael did when they killed Bug's dad, but they will change back quickly if they feel deceived, which he did. Either way, he remains oblivious to the chess game being played with the police, and they are closing in on him. However, his luck kicks in again, as the Trojan horse is put in charge of MCU due to a chess game being played within the police department, and the investigation into Marlowe slows down. It's here that we get to the point where Marlowe joins the co-op. Now, Prop Joe was very Machiavellian in his setup of the co-op and is getting Marlowe to join, but I cover that in Prop Joe's Machiavellian episode, so I won't go into it here. Upon joining, whether intentional or not, Marlowe implements three very Machiavellian principles, considering his goal was always to be the top dog. First, he learned from great men. He soaked up a lot of information from Prop Joe, and as previously mentioned, this was the first time his crew took a huge operational leap forward. Second, War is not to be avoided, only postponed to your benefit, and he used that time to fulfill the third Machiavellian principle, use times of peace to gather resources. In Marlowe's case, those resources were knowledge, and most importantly, the connection. Once the connection was secure, he was ready to make his play for the top, but by then the bodies in the vacants had been found. However, once again Marlowe's luck kicked in as the MCU disbanded, and he was able to run free a little while longer. During this time, he decides to make his move on Prop Joe. Machiavelli stated to always keep an eye on troop morale, and Marlowe noticed a rift between Cheese and Prop Joe. When the opportunity presented itself, Marlowe used the beef between Cheese and Hungry Man to get Cheese to give up his uncle. Cheese's betrayal of Prop Joe, despite everything he did for him, is a perfect example of why Machiavelli says it's better to be feared than loved. Because while you can't make people love you, you can make them fear you. After killing Prop Joe and taking over the co-op, he quickly disbands it, which could be viewed as Machiavellian, since a prince takes counsel when they want. However, he is also quickly becoming hated, which is the worst thing a prince can be, especially by the most powerful people. It's at this point that Marlowe and his crew get arrested, and his supposed luck kicks in again. I go into this a bit more in depth in the Avon vs. Marlowe episode, but I think a good case can be made that this was the worst outcome for Marlowe. Now, obviously walking away with Scott free with millions would be great luck for most of us, but for Marlowe, I think he would have rather been dead or in jail than out of the game. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Ultimately, while many of Marlowe's individual moves were Machiavellian, his overall character was not, and this would have left him in a terrible position moving forward had he not been arrested. Everyone would have hated him. He would have had to have killed Cheese ASAP. Once something happened to Chris and Snoop, his crew would have been significantly diminished, and he would have a much bigger target for police since he would now be the kingpin, not just one of many. Well, thanks for watching this episode here on Bully Whispers. As always, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you at the next score.